What's up, explorers of the universe? I'm sure you guys are usually not afraid to traverse tricky mental terrains and tease out as many subtleties of truth that our subjective perspectives can allow. In philosophy, humanity has an ancient tradition of continually asking the big question, searching for a theory to unify all the observations, thoughts, and feelings that so often seem to be flat out contradictory. The very word philosophy implies a love of wisdom in its etymology, but what is wisdom exactly? Just how are our moral interpretations of words and concepts holding us back from acting in accordance with our actual values? And how does the prescription of morality imposed by others interfere with the natural development and evolution of our will? Today, I am honored to host a deeply thoughtful and psychedelically inspired writer and philosopher from the UK named Peter Schwerstedt H. I recently checked out his book, Pneumonautics, a deep examination on metaphysics, neo-nihilism, and how brain chemistry influencing substances have informed humanity's ideas on the nature of the self and the universe. Like any book worth reading, I found myself at times cheering Peter on as I followed his reasoning, and other times finding my own culturally seated beliefs being challenged to the point of extreme ego discomfort, for which I have to thank Peter big time, because any chance to see one's beliefs from the root level and getting triggered is a good way to see that. It's an opportunity to make a new choice, to reject dogma, and start operating from only what one can know. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation as a way to further understand what I think and why I think it, but more importantly, to bring you guys into the mindscape of a brilliant thinker in the line of Kant, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and all the great minds that came before. So, dear listeners, now is the time to open up that infinite non-local transmission of universal consciousness and send your own personalized energy signature of enthusiastic welcome to our guest today, Peter Schurstad H. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Chance. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I suppose a good place to start is to actually allow you to make your own introductions about yourself and your philosophy, as most likely you've updated some of your own thinking from the time of writing pneumonautics like any good thinker would. <laughs> well, I can tell you where I am now. In the final year of my PhD at Exeter, my PhD is on the philosophy of mind, specifically panpsychism. And I have changed some views, actually, regarding that, regarding the mind. Before my PhD, I was a philosophy lecturer in London, in a college there for six years. And before that, I was at Warwick University, where I did a philosophy and continental philosophy before that, well, I was born in Sweden. I was raised in Cornwall, which is southwest Britain. Altogether, I lived in London for 10 years, I think, or so. And then I've returned to Cornwall in the last five years or so. Generally speaking, I should say there are about there are four main uh, philosophies which incorporate the mind-matter problem, how mind and matter relate. Idealism is one. Physicalism is another, which is probably the most common one in the West at the moment. Uh, dualism is another, so soul and body are distinct, which is also very common because of it, uh, because of the fact that religions generally endorse that. And then there's panpsychism, which is the view that I'm most sympathetic to, which is that all of actuality consists, has an element of mind however basic that may be. So even molecules have an element of mind, not consciousness, but a form of sentience. So I was, before, for a few years ago, I suppose I was quite enamored by idealism. So idealism is the view that essentially mind is the reality and matter is a projection of our minds. And the most prevalent thinker of idealism is probably Immanuel Kant, who uh, died in 1804, I believe. He influenced Schopenhauer. Uh, Schopenhauer took it one step further by saying, uh, we can know one thing in itself. Kant thought we couldn't know what things are actually in themselves. Schopenhauer said, we can know one thing, which is the will. And then Nietzsche pushed that one step further and said, well, this is not a will to survive, but a will to power. What I think is most interesting to get into distinguishing starting out is why it could be considered more parsimonious to conceive of all matter as a projection of mind. I also think it might be equally parsimonious to drop the distinction between mind and matter altogether and look at them as sort of a free-flowing interchange. However, whenever we're talking about mind existing in things that we consider inanimate objects, I think... Uh, sentience and consciousness are definitely worth distinguishing. How would you make that distinction? 
Generally, I, consciousness I consider to be a form of sentience which is very highly complex, so it can be uh, self-reflective, I suppose that's self-consciousness really. It can consider alternative actions, it can imagine those, it, can have a, it has a long memory and has a number of different sensory modes, so like vision, hearing, taste, touch and so on. That's consciousness which humans ha- have and the higher organisms, you know, um, apes and dolphins and dogs and whatnot. But then also we have a subconscious and uh, we, so the subconscious, well, some people are skeptical about that, but I believe it. Subconscious is a um, form of sentience, which is then, you know, by definition, not consciousness. So when we talk about lesser beings, let's go to ants, for example, or insects generally, you know, it seems uh, more plausible that they don't have long-term memories and they don't have all the modalities we do, but nonetheless, they have a form of sentience, which is somewhat more akin to our subconscious. So there's a form of, so, so sentience doesn't only include consciousness. You should see as consciousness really as the cream on the cake of all of reality. One philosopher that's been a big influence on me is Jung, although I haven't studied Jung as much as you've studied any one of the philosophers we just mentioned beforehand here. So I won't necessarily say I know exactly what he thinks, but from his looking at the on the subconscious and the conscious, I think we can for sure agree that there's things that we know, but we don't know that we know actively in our mind. And so that it, that constitutes a subconscious. But then if you're looking at the reality itself as entirely based in mind and sort of a unified mind field as the, the thing that matters emerging from and also consciousness within individualized matter platforms like human beings, then you can also kind of look at things that are outside of yourself that are part of this mind but are not conscious as part of the subconscious. And because the mind is a unified pleroma of sorts, you have therefore the ability to maybe postulate that everything outside of you is your unconscious or subconscious in much the same way that whenever you're in a dream state, it's not really arguable to most people that what it is that you're experiencing is the contents of your unconscious being externalized for you to move through and, and create narrative and understanding within. Well, that's, that's a sort of psychological theory um, about dream states and uh, hypno, you know, hypnagogic states and psychedelic states and whatever. I'm, I don't know if I fully accept it because, for example, in certain dream states and certain psychedelic states, certainly you seem to, some, some experiences, some high, you know, high grade, heavy, you know, high dose experiences can be so extreme, so transcendent of yourself and your culture that it's very hard to link it to your own psyche, you know, your own psychology. Of course, you can interpret it that way and see certain gigantic glass-like space structures as some element of your past. But um, it's hard to prove that in any way. And it seems, seems to me rather that it's an access to something else, something other than yourself. Just like when you uh, see the world, you, you see the objective world, you see things which are not you, you know, according, you know, if you're not an idealist, that is. This is all speculative. And when we talk about these things, of course, we can't use proof in any way because proof only applies to, well, you can strictly only have proof in logic and mathematics. You can't even have it in science. In science, you just get a, a working theory which um, explains phenomena and uh, you hope that it won't be falsified in the future, but you can never know that it's true, of course. So in metaphysics, one has to speculate. I personally yeah, don't see the all, some obviously, but I don't see all states as necessarily pertaining to oneself. I agree with you in the sense of the individual egoic self and the one life that a person is contained within and and all those experiences definitely don't contain uh, nearly enough of the sheer range of potential information that comes through in these other mystical or transcendent or psychedelic states or what has been called by you know some poets sublime so that sublime could be some sort of imaginary experience that is also sort of like a a sensory experience even though it's imaginary that is like looking into the realm the platonic realm of uh ideals in a yeah, sense. Well, yeah i was going to mention that because of course when one um intuits let's say a mathematical truth like the pythagorean theorem although it's not 
a, an intuition, a perception of something that's physically out there and other than oneself in that sense. It's still something that is objective. It's something that is not you. In other words, we discover the Pythagorean theorem. We discover the truths of logic. We don't invent them. They're out there. Thus, they are forms of perception which are, let's say, non-physical, but nonetheless are objectively real. And because we know that that, well, I mean, it's disputable, but because we, you know, I would say we know that um, we, we discover these things, therefore they are objective in a sense. We know that perception is more, or rather, we know that veridical or objective perception is more than merely what we see in the physical world. So if we accept that, then we can be more open-minded to taking certain uh, mystical states or whatever as being um, intuitions of something objective rather than merely subjective. But uh, you're entering sort of, you know, very high speculative metaphysics here. And you have to sort of account for the facts in the best way. You know, we're talking about inference to best explanation. But I was just, uh, funnily enough, I was just reading Karl Popper on something related to this. He, he's got this uh, theory about world one, world two, and world three, as he calls it. World one is the physical world. World two is the psychological world, or the world of mental states, ideas, thoughts, feelings, and whatnot, your, your mental states. And then world three, for him, is the world of artifacts, human, human creations, but also theorems. He uses world three against physicalism, against someone who believes that only world one is the case. He says uh, Frege had this theory. Frege was a German logician. Frege had a, had a theory and it contained an inconsistency, a, co a contradiction that Bertrand Russell pointed out later on. But that, that inconsistency existed in his theory, even though nobody was aware of it, not even himself, for years. But nonetheless, it was there, it existed. So it wasn't even an idea, it wasn't even a mental state, a World 2 event. And as it wasn't that, it was neither a World 1 event, because I mean, even if you believe that mental states are fully reducible to physical states, you know, the neural correlates of consciousness, if it wasn't an idea in anyone's mind, then neither was it brain activity. So, but nonetheless, that inconsistency was there. It existed objectively, and it was discovered by Russell, and then Frege, Frege realized it. So when we talk about what is real or what exists, I think it's fair to say that we can't simply say that what exists is the physical. We can't say that what exists is merely the physical and the mental, or just the mental. But I think I'm kind of sympathetic to this triad of of reality, this triadic ontology, you could call it, of, of the physical, the mental, and then what has been called the universal or the platonic or the world of essences or Whitehead calls it eternal ideas, whatever you will. But nonetheless, there seems to be this abstract realm which actually exists even though, even though it's not necessary that anyone has ever thought about the objects therein. So if you, if, you, if you accept that, I mean, this is a massive debate in medieval times about, you know, whether universals were real or whether nominal or whatever. But if you do accept that, then it opens up your worldview. And I think what it does really is it opens up your worldview. It sort of um, gets rid of certain dogmas you might have about, you know, no, well, obviously only physics is real, only the physical world's real or whatever. But the question is then where does it leave you? Well, <laughs> in a way, it sort of leaves you even more ignorant, or at least it leaves you realizing your ignorance. You sort of, you're left in an abyss. And then you, you, you become sort of a, an ultimate skeptic. I mean, more, more of a skeptic than a physicalist skeptic even, because you don't believe that can account for everything. I think for some people that can be mentally damaging, psychologically damaging, you know, because a lot of people want psychological security. They, they just, you know, what demand the truth, especially I, I believe people in their twenties, I think they're sort of a very strict, they've got the psychological need to know the truth. You know, I'm in my late thirties now and I, I sort of realized that there's less and less, at least in me, there's less and less a need for this certainty. And one sort of moves away from certainty, the more knowledge one acquires, ironically. What it makes me think of is the Nietzschean conceptualization of God being dead in the sense that there's no ultimate descriptive morality to the universe, just as there's no way to find, give finality to any scientific law. In truth, most things are just tendencies of the universe because we can't look at the full spectrum of what's before and, and what comes next. I think the realm of ideas or the, the essences that, that spiritual reality is in a way 
a reality composed comprised of potentials. I think there's a force that seems to express through humanity in particular, but through all life, which is the Nietzschean will to power. In my way of looking at it, what the will to power tends to look like is increase of complexity and range of expression and freedom to make more choices and have a wider range of experience potentials, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I see it in the same way. I mean, a lot of people think Nietzsche's will to power is a sort of a principle of greed, a sort of a Wall Street type principle, but, you know, it, not at all. I mean, it, it doesn't encapsulate that, but it's much wider, as you suggest. And it's really a will to, ultimately metaphysical will to, to gain more power. But how do you do that? Well, it's uh, grasping more of your environment, more, more space. How do you do that? By, in terms of making more complex your modes of perception, for example. In other words, the complexification of species. And uh, in, in that sense, you can see evolution. Of course, evolution doesn't always go become more complex, but at least in Nietzsche's view and also in Bergson's and Whitehead's and a number of other thinkers, there's this sort of, you could say, underlying, underlying push for nature to develop more and more complex, more and more beautiful, Whitehead would say, instances, examples, in other words, species. You can also see Nietzsche's Ubermensch, Overman in that light. You know, he um, talks about this new, new species of man. Sometimes he says, you know, man is a conclusion. Other times he says the overman is a new species. He probably changed his mind on this. But nonetheless, there is, seems to me, a push for evolution. When he said God was dead, you know, God is dead, he meant that, okay, you know, we don't, we no longer in the West, intellectually at least, believe in God. Where does that leave us in terms of our striving? You know, what is our cause? Because before it was, you know, to be godlike, you know, to attain heaven and so on. If that's not no longer tell us for us what's left, well, first of all, you get the horrible abyss, another abyss of uh, the sort of passive nihilism. You know, there's nothing, nothing means anything, and, and so on. And there are no objective values. But then, of course, you can move on and say, well, if there are only subjective values, then I shall, uh, I shall endeavour to appreciate those despite the non-objectivity. And if we recognize within nature a principle, a drive, principle drive that explains a lot, again, inference to best explanation rather than empirical proof, because that's not um, possible in metaphysics. If we accept that, then we could value that. And that becomes, at least it became for, for Nietzsche, sort of um, his cause, you know. He, especially in the later works and his later notes, he talks about this kind of... Uh, aligning himself into the valuation of what he sees as the world power as uh, the sort of post post god world and of course that can go horribly wrong you know but uh, without it you don't have are, freedom we don't have freedom without the possibility of going horribly wrong yeah i mean otherwise we'd be determined by the past and freedom is part of the world power so the more the more um, perception you have over over reality, the more freedom you have to take different alter, different options, alternate routes. You know, basic organism is much less free than we are because it hasn't got all the all the different uh, modes of perception that we have. Yeah. Well, one thing that I found myself thinking a lot about as I was reading through your book, and especially about the Nietzschean conceptualization of you know the 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 nihilism in general of the you know no grounds for any morality to ever be prescribed. And there's, you know, there is definitely no way that you can ever give somebody uh, statements that you should do this because it is completely manipulative, no matter what, it's not based in a, a fact. I think I can agree with that, but there is also the notion that whatever your will is, is not exactly consciously you, if I'm not mistaken, that that is sort of, a force of the universe, if you will. And so I think that is actually what has been called the deity by some philosophers or the, the divinity that's in the realm of ideals or the realm of essences or the force, the universal force of love that is what pushes sentience to higher levels of sensitivity. And therefore evolution is kind of a counter force in some ways too, because it's, we cut off certain parts of sensitivity, but then we need to enhance other parts of sensitivity. And that will to power is sort of a, 
constant readjusting of what sensitivity is useful for the values that we currently hold. But I think it's interesting that there does seem to be kind of a force outside of us in a way that comes into certain people more in what you would call inspiration. And other people are left in a more of a completely passive, you know, just receiving what the external world programs them to be. And that sounds more like Schopenhauer than Nietzsche. He, he wants, Schopenhauer always strives to lose the will. And he talks about the Eastern religions in a sense as well. And he talks about the power of ours, aesthetics, as a means of overcoming the will, which for him, he's known as a pessimist because the will only leads to uh, suffering, really, you know, boredom or frustration, whatever it may be. Because he's a Kantian, but in a non-ethical way, he rejects Kant's ethics, but he accepts Kant's ontology. He believes that ultimately reality, what Kant calls noumena, the, the world in itself, you know, apart from how we perceive it. Schopenhauer says that it's, it's a unified thing because space and time, which we use to differentiate things into blocks or into instants, they are mere projection, projections of our minds, which means that if we don't project space and time and causality upon the world, then the world in itself cannot be spatiotemporal, in which case it cannot be differentiated, in which case it, it is one. And Schopenhauer's view was that, although Schopenhauer was neither, like Nietzsche, a prescriptive moralist, in other words, he didn't say you could say one ought to do this or one ought not to do that. I mean, he said that leads to contradiction. Uh, for for reasons I've given in neo nihilism, the chapter in Numenautics, he still was a descriptive moralist in the sense that he believed that he valued certain characteristics and certain actions, even though he didn't believe in free will. He didn't believe people were free to do them. But nonetheless, he valued them, just like one can value a rabbit and uh, disvalue a rat. It's not the rabbits or the rats' uh, fault, but nonetheless, you can still value things in that way, and. Um, Schopenhauer believed that compassion, which was for him an ultimate virtue, was actually an intuition of that unity, that real unity behind the world of appearance, behind the world of phenomena, as Kant called it. I have an instinctual agreement with that notion. And through psychedelic experiences in particular, I've, in a subjective, non-provable way, of course, I've had the personal experience of the, I think the idea that doing unto others as you would have done unto yourself does have the kernel of truth in that as things are one and the universe is the a reflective mind substance that is, you know, there's the will and then there's representation of it in a sense. You can expect to get back what you're doing to others in a sense. And so you can prescribe for yourself a morality out of that. You just can't prescribe it onto others. And also, if when you prescribe a morality onto others, of course, you're sort of trying to dominate them, which in itself seems immoral. And that's why Nietzsche said morality, you know, comes to eat itself because it basically tells people what to do. And in that sense, it's immoral in itself. I mean, that what you said reminds me of, you know, the old um, Asian, the old um, East Asian uh, expression, uh, thou art that. Schopenhauer certainly was inspired by the Upanishads um, and Eastern texts. But I suppose it rests on this, and this is, this is where Schopenhauer and Nietzsche diverged. Do you accept that reality in itself is, is unified and non-a-spatio-temporal, non-spatial, non-temporal, or do you not accept that and, and believe that reality is spatio-temporal, as is a general worldview today? And then Nietzsche did, well, he, he rejected Kant's ontology and metaphysics. And he did believe that the world in itself is pluralistic. In other words, it's full of different, um, it is differentiated and it's differentiated, differentiated if you take his later works in his notebooks and Beyond Good and Evil and some later works there. He believes that it's differentiated fundamentally by the wills, the wills to power. Because he says um, every force has an internal aspect, and an affect form, he says. In other words, an emotional aspect, and that is this drive this will to power so that the question so the question ultimately is yeah do you you know what is your underlying ontology and how do you justify that and then you get into some you know you can talk about Kantian people as well people have spoken about Kantian metaphysics since since he wrote it in the late 18th century very 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 complicated topic it's got a lot going for it but it's got a lot of problems as well and of course that ontology then will feed into your ethics there's also another way, though, that in which you might feel a unity with um, your environment, even 
without accepting that the world is unified in the Schopenhauerian sense, which is this, that Nietzsche, Nietzsche, for example, says that the human body is a city almost of wills to power. It's not just one will to power that that is, um, let's say, me or you. Rather, there are many drives that comprise ourselves. And then, of course, we are we are that unity that it becomes our body as a city that becomes um, part of a greater unit. And this is straight going away from Nietzsche now, but if you uh, consider perhaps someone like um, Fechner, the panpsychist, he believed that, uh, you know, worlds had their own kind of uh, subjectivity, solar systems, galaxies. I mean, Plato originally had the idea of the world soul, you know, everything's footnote to him. As yeah, as occultists as have held on to the notion of there being spirits relating to planets and even to countries and cities. Yep. You know, that's I mean, been part of Western that, occultism forever. Right. And, and uh, well, I, you know, I know Plato had the idea, but it probably precedes him even. But anyway, so, you know, it could be that these um, larger holonic units, as it were, despite the fact that they're not unified into one, an experience could be a kind of sympathy with that greater unit. But again, all very speculative. But my, I, suppose my, I suppose my ultimate point is that feeling, feeling a, this what Freud calls the oceanic feeling in the mystical state doesn't necessarily mean you've tasted the unity of all things. It could, have, it could mean other, other things as well. I can definitely agree with that because no matter what level of transcendent or seemingly enlightening experience I've ever had, whether psychedelic or otherwise, there's always a further threshold to be reached. There's always a vaster ocean out there. That's what infinity is. But I think since we've got a better understanding of fractality in nature and in mathematics, it to me seems possible to look at both Nietzsche and the Nietzsche's idea that there's that the wills are separate and then the other notion that it's all actually a unified non-spatial, non-temporal whole. I could see it as easily being that the separate manifestations of will are like fractal uh, dimensionalities of scope whether you're looking at a city that's one dimension of scale a, a human that's a dimension of scale you look at the human's individual gut biome and all the research that the concrete evidence that they're demonstrating that your very mind states and behavior patterns are dictated by these colonies of bacteria inside you and then that could very well be where the ancients got the notion of demonic possession being related to different illnesses as well and behavior patterns because they may not have had the ability to get a microscope and look at the bacteria in there, but through observational evidence, they can come to a, a agreement that there's a, they can create that concept and, and apply it. And that works well enough in some cases. Yeah, it's quite possible. Even if it could have been, um, even if it were not true, it could be effective, you know, as the placebo effect shows or the no nocebo effect shows. Even though we've got microscopes now and whatever, we're still quite in the dark with regard to the truths of these matters. And that's but and then I come back to Kant there because of, you know Kant, Kant's really famous, mostly famous really for sort of pointing out the limitations of human knowledge. For example, for Kant, you can never be fully self-conscious. You can't ever know your real self, pure abception. You can only understand that it must exist as that which unifies your memories and, and, and whatnot. But you can't you can't gain access to it because once you gain access to it, you're projecting uh, space, time, and all these categories onto it. So you sort of um, it's like you can't see darkness, you know, because if you shine a light to see it, then of course it's not darkness. I think this is when we talk about these huge questions about you know cosmic uh, teleology and uh, and uh, all these holonic hierarchies and whatever you know and uh, you know I wonder if we can really ever ever acquire those truths or whether we're like um, bees looking at a board of chess you know we can see the we can see the pieces but we've got no idea that it's a game or that there are certain techniques within it and whatnot you know are we not are we not limited that way but then of course you know that that thought itself leads goes back to what we were talking about a moment ago with regard to a kind of cause to get you out of this abyss you know which is to push the evolution of mankind so that perhaps um we, we gain a greater understanding of these things
become the future. I think the for me, the way out of the abyss was the realization that meaning is up to me to create, value is up to me to hold, you know, and that's and it only makes sense because if you aren't the source of your own values, then then it is coming from an outside system and you are being manipulated and controlled. And that does see like to me. I think if we are looking at, if we are bees looking at a big chessboard, the minds that are playing the chess game could very well be larger mind structures and systems that are, you know, higher up the fractal, like planets themselves, for example, that we just really can't understand or conceptualize what that form of consciousness even is. However, there are ways of going within and, uh, you know, through psychedelics, through meditation practices that do seem to give people at least a, their own personal, you know, telos, if you will, based on that and even potentially way of influencing those larger minds. I think that's where we get the sciences of astrology and the systems of correlation between different bodily organs and, and uh, emotional states and planetary systems and, you know, parts of the zodiac and whether or not. You know, that, that's all very difficult to sift through. I think what's interesting right now in the place we're at is how the will to power and the dynamics of master and slave moralities in conflict are playing out in the world right now. How there's new versions of each coming into play, whether it's the, you know, the rise of white nationalism and that type of pseudo master mentality and then the the slave morality of the new age movement and the, you know, let go and let everything just happen and don't worry about anything type of mentality. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's so much of the Christian, the, the Christian moral dogma that has completely just transferred right into the so-called new age movement. And I see it everywhere and it, it bums me out how easily people basically fall into cult mentalities that are not much different than Christianity. They just say, oh, the universe wants this to happen as opposed to God or Allah wills yeah. it. And you know what I mean? Yeah, there's not much difference really. And um, I mean, it makes me think of William Blake. He says, you know, you create, create your own system or be enslaved by another man's. You know, that was written before Nietzsche ever uh, was born, but um, it sort of sums it up. I think, yeah, with white nationalism and uh, the New Age movement, these are all simply uh, causes which can be reduced to wills to power, you know, beyond the human being, then obviously, as a group of beings. They all have their own justifications, but I think Nietzsche's helpful. Well, Nietzsche's informative in this way that he, he will say that, okay. First of all, there's an ulterior motive there, which is to empower yourself, even if you're unaware of it. You empower yourself by saying that things should be like this and we're going to fight for that, whatever it is. Secondly, if there is no God, then, he argues, there is no objective standards by which you can say you are right and your opponent is wrong. Whoever you are, whether you're a white nationalist or a new age person or a left left wing advocate whatever it may be there's no there's actually without god there's no standard and in the 20th century there are a number of philosophers meta ethicists anti realists they they argued this in more in more detail really just just pointing out people like uh, cl stevenson aj others you know if you say someone ought to do something or something is good it sounds immediately like it's a statement such as you know this is made of wood or this is made of glass but with those latter two statements you can you can uh, verify them you can directly see whether it's true or not but with the first ones you know this is a good thing or one ought to do that there's nothing you can see that would prove it in any way and more than that, that was, some of that was based on logical positivism which failed and you have to also distinguish that the reason for that is although you might be t completely sure personally that you know, one action is good and re results in good for another person. There is someone in the world that would have the opposite feeling and think the opposite. Yeah. I mean, even if you argue something like, um, you know, yeah, well, this causes more pleasure and less pain, it simply postpones the question. You know, you say, well, why is more pleasure? How can you how can you prove in any way that more, having more pleasure is better than 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 the opposite or having 
less pain is better. This is not, this is not, not, certainly not an empirical proposition that you can verify in any way. It's neither a logical proposition or a mathematical proposition that you can prove in any way. So it could be, if you believed in certain normative Platonic forms, then it could be a factual proposition, but you'd have to prove that they existed. And even though I'm, I'm uh, sympathetic to Platonic forms, I'm not sympathetic to normative moral ones, strangely. So anyway, so you've got these, so you have these propositions that, that people, people believe and they just think it's obviously right, but no, it's not at all obvious. And, and the way, the way you can always, what betrays that is when you ask them like, well, yeah, but why, why is this correct? They'll just, they'll either say, you know, duh, well, it's obvious or, or, or they'll just look at you blankly. And then you realize that, well, I haven't got an argument, but yet they're basing, in many cases, they're basing the whole life upon this cause, which they think is the right thing to do. You know? But it really just, um, amounts to nil comes to nothing. So, uh, so, so, so what is it then? Well, if, it, if they're not engaging in a cause which is based on any factuality, then, then what, what is the basis of it? And then that brings you back to Nietzsche. Well, actually, psychologically, it, it um, boosts, you know, it gives them a sense of power. This is ultimately what's going on behind all the rhetoric. There's this constant driving of power that pushes all these movements. It's something that's unavoidable, you know. What I think comes into play heavily that was not necessarily discussed in your book, but is the notion of scarcity of power, scarcity, uh, like the fact that one person having power means other people inherently don't have power. And I think it depends on the valuation that the group of people in question have, whether one person's will to power is to be in control and dominating of others because they're afraid of what it would be like if they weren't versus someone that has confidence enough in their own personal power to the point where they don't care what others do at all and do not interfere with the power of the others, which I think is actually what creates the personal power of fearlessness in the individual because there is, if the the whole universe is a reflective mirror like thing, then by not restricting the will to power in others, the others will be less inclined to restrict the will to power in them. And then when it does occur, they'll have, uh, if you have, if an individual has a realization in a sense of the infinite realm that's emanating self into them in a sense, in that Kantian will being external idea. If you look at it that way, you know, I think what's important about philosophy is that even if you can't necessarily prove your ontology, you can you can construct one that empowers you. And then from Nietzscheans, the Nietzschean sense of you know will the power being what everything's about, it actually becomes important to do so so that yeah. you don't get dominated. Yeah, two things I should say about that. I mean, one of the first things that Nietzsche writes in his book of eighteen eighty six called Beyond Good and Evil is that um, it's not the value of a proposition a sentence. It's not whether it's true or false, but how much it can induce power. And that's because ultimately uh, truth can be useful to power, um, but, but so can falsity. Falsity can also be uh, useful to power. And, um, and that's what really counts, because for, for Nietzsche, the will to truth is but a part of the will to power. Now, I don't know if I personally agree with that, but that's his view. Also, with regard to uh, the will to power and dominating personalities, I mean... If you, if you are trying to cap others' power, then it's a sign, a symptom that you are, you have less power, you have little power, really. You know, you're getting very defensive and you need to do this in order to sort of uh, maintain your own. So someone with an overflow of power will be uh, very generous. You know, he won't be at all, or she won't be at all um, worried about the power of others because it just would not affect their own confidence, their own sense of power. But, you know, as we've suggested, as we've been intimating here, I don't, I'm not fully convinced that you can reduce everything to, to power structures. I think a lot can be reduced that way. But, um, for example, in the works of uh, Bertrand Russell and Whitehead and others, there's this notion, it's always ambiguous, but there's this notion that the drive to knowledge, what Nietzsche would call the will to truth, somehow transcends our own interests quite often, you know, transcends our own power. It seems to be a separate drive in us 
which we're not in us and in, in 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 some people, but there seems to be this drive just to gain more and more knowledge, even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't benefit us. And then others as well, an artistic drive, you know, a, a drive to create uh, beauty, which again might not be in your own interest. You know, it might uh, it might uh, cause you to lose your family and live in poverty and and whatever. You know, so it's not. Even, yeah, so, so I think how uh, I mean, this is my criticism of Nietzsche. I think he's too reductive in this sense. So I, I'm sort of developing a system now where I sort of, sort of mix this notion of uh, will to power with a broader drive, broader drives in reality, which I get from um, mostly Whitehead, as it happens, Alfred North Whitehead. I definitely like what you're saying there. It's def- it, it jives with the thoughts I was having as I was reading your book, and you know I. I was thinking all about how human creativity is important to one's will to power and how you can't quite completely separate freedom and morality in the sense that you there is a certain type of morality that does bring about more freedom in that the philosophy of being powerful enough to not need to try to control things gives you enough power to react to anything that you do need to deal with in the, in the primordial chaos. And so how do you see human creativity as, how does, how does this emerge? And, you know, we're obviously distinguished from other beings that we can observe with this ability. And how do you regard that more in, in context to one's will to power? Yeah. I mean, it's a massive question. Um, (laughs) I think, um, Okay, well, the, what's the opposite? Of, let's start this way. The opposite of creativity seems to be determinism. You know, that there's no creativity at all. Everything is determined. Uh, the problem with that is, of course, uh, well, like David Hume said, we can't know that to be true because just for the reason that the problem of induction, you know, just because we see all these regularities, like the speed of light, uh, which leads to us creating laws, like, um, you know, C, constant of speed of light, just because we've seen that so many times doesn't mean it will be like that in in the future, you know? The Whitehead also says the same thing, you know, we should talk about regularities in our particular era rather than constants of nature or laws of nature. So we have got no real logical reason to believe in determinism in that sense these laws are simply man-made you know we don't know and they're probably a legacy of platonism you know that there are these eternal truths and also um, of religion that there are you know these tablets of of eternal truth you know moral truths so you can reject you can say that determinism hasn't got uh, uh, validity in that sense and so therefore creativity opens up as an option also another problem with this form of determinism of course quantum physics shows that you don't get pure determinism but another aspect another problem as well is to do with mentality so most people you know most people on the street would say that um your beliefs and your desires and your ambitions and your calculations have an effect upon the world you know you sort of uh, if you've got ambition to do something it would lead you to take this train to, you know, for an interview or whatever it may be but of course, in a, de- a fully deterministic world, your mentality will have no effect upon physicality whatsoever, because your ambition was, is merely a product of your of your brain or your your, your physical body. Every desire you have is, is just um, a determinable product, and, and essentially, at least epiphenomenalism, the view that um, the mind is simply like the steam from a steam train. This was Thomas Huxley's analogy. But uh, the problem with that is, as Karl Popper pointed out, the problem is why we evolved mentality at all if it has no effect upon the world. I mean, Popper says it's an anti-evolutionary theory. And most philosophers today will not want to endorse epiphenomenalism because it leads to a number of other paradoxes as well. So if you want to reject epiphenomenalism, as I think I believe most people do, for, for logical and evolutionary reasons and, and more, one has to accept mental causation, that mentality has a certain power. In other words, a certain creativity. And so by rejecting the opposite of creativity, you come to realize that it must be an element of nature. It must be. Um, as to its precise nature, that's, that's for the future to understand. But I think at least we can use reason, logic, 
to realize that it must be there. I like to look at this in the concept of the bigger cycles that humanity is a part of, but completely unaware of because they're too large to view the potential that, you know, and this is of course wildly speculative and unprovable, but if the laws, so to speak of the physical universe are not necessarily set in stone and we can't prove that they are and that things seem to be emanating from mind in the sense that, what we experience in the 3d world is actually a holographic creation of the mind that doesn't have any actual space or time to it then we could in the past perhaps if we didn't have collective belief making us all stuck in a notion we could maybe even do crazy things like fly or maybe in the future that's something that could happen maybe in the past that's something that's happened maybe that's where we get the philosopher's notion of the golden age of the gods if you will hmm. well i you'd have to send me you'd have to send me that as a paper and I, I never really thought about it that that way but um i don't yeah i don't you know i, I suppose it's possible but um just only speculatively possible yeah. but i definitely entertain that potential right yeah i yeah i don't know i mean that's that's a new idea to me but yeah yeah look into that one thing that i wanted to get back to going around back to sort of the morality of power is do you see a tendency in those with high degrees of power to preach one morality to the masses but act quite differently themselves uh yeah i mean that's the typical politicians um role isn't it you know or the church's role in, in history. I mean, the typical example there is the Catholic Church, especially around the Renaissance times, you know, 500 years ago or so, 400 years ago, prescribing all these morals, but uh, of course do, doing quite often the total opposite. I mean, the, the classic example of that, I think, is um, relating it to Nietzsche again. Cesare Borgia, who uh, was a cardinal, and he was the son of uh, Pope Alexander, uh, about 500 years ago in Rome. He was actually a bastard child. In other words, he was an illegitimate child with uh, the Pope and a, and a prostitute. But in order to become a cardinal, he had to uh, he had to be a legitimate child. So the Pope, his father, wrote a decree saying that he was actually a legitimate child and not his own child, therefore, you know. But at the same time, he wrote a secret decree uh, saying that actually, no, th- this is my child. So there's an example of how the church from the Pope, from the, the top, the, the peak of the church was knowingly uh, hypocritical with regard to its morality, you know, saying saying you should do one thing and, and doing the opposite. The, another really good example of that that I just uh, came across would be like, you know, people in Catholicism especially would look at God as infallible, especially in the past, and therefore the Pope as his agent is therefore infallible, right? But then why do we have... This one particular saga, well, I can't remember which king it was. The uh, the English king who had had a wife, Catherine, beheaded a lot of wives, killed a lot of Henry VIII. That's right, Henry VIII. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so he he had to ask the pope for permission to marry his first wife because it was illegal, and then he the pope broke the rules to allow him to marry the first wife, and then when he wanted to divorce that wife to get an heir, the the pope would not allow that, and so he divorced England from the church and had the Protestant revolution, a complete and total loss of power for the Catholic church. So therefore there is no infallible Pope, right? I mean, why would he, that makes no sense. No, I mean, that was a big mistake on the, on the Catholics part, but then again, it was probably inevitable anyway. I mean, it followed Luther's revolution um, a few, a couple of decades beforehand, Calvin. So it was on, you know, this um, sort of a rebellion against Catholic church was already underway in Europe in Northern Europe. And so it might have happened no matter what the Catholic Church did. But I actually yeah, look at it as the Catholic Church possibly seeded the entire dialectic of Catholicism versus Protestantism as a way of creating a sort of controlled opposition and maintaining a power hierarchy. Mm, possibly. I mean, it, it led, of course, to um, the Jesuits, you know, the very sort of and the inquisition you know so in a way it, it led it led to a strengthening of the church because they had to get very defensive and militaristic suddenly and uh, and that coincided with the uh, discovery of the new world of course you know you might say that there's um some kind of correlation between between the the reformation and the taking over of the americas the middle and south americas by the catholic church well that's one of the most interesting 
power struggles of all time was the Spanish conquest of Mexico. Quite incredible story to get into. Horrific and gruesome more than any Hollywood movie as well. But but again, I mean, a lot of that history is, for example, especially the Native Americans in the northern part, you know, that I often see all these stories that they were these peace loving people, spiritual people, and then the you know, the Westerners came and took over. But of course they were warring tribes as well, you know, scalping people. And of course the you know, the uh South American, the Mesoamerican tribes used to uh, you know, rip the heart out of a living person every day. <laughs> so they had their own power stretches and power games and wars and whatever. And then um South of Europe came and dominated. But there's no, I don't see this as a good and evil, you know, fight between good and evil. It's just, again, a fight between power stretches. And someone will come in the future and take over yet again, maybe the Chinese, who knows. I think the reason why we see the, like, the corrupt expression of power so much seems to be because there's a disparate spreading out of power. And of course, the answer is not to state that every man is equal and everyone should have exact equal rights because it's unenforceable. I think the real solution is true self-empowerment for the individual level to take place because if we're all on a more equal playing field power-wise, but we all earned it in a sense and it's not from some sort of dogmatic decree or some sort of externally enforced thing, but because we're all you know, tapped into what the source of individual power really is, which is sort of getting behind all your own belief structures and to the root of knowing your own self for what you yeah. can. That, that could totally change the world in a different way. You have to um, overcome yourself, over, you know, control yourself first. Yeah, absolutely. I, t I completely agree with that. Um, you can't just demand that everyone treats you with respect and whatever, because that's just in itself subconsciously, even though people might agree with it, it's, you know, it's, it will probably lead to the opposite. So, and also one can, in, one can learn how to deal with situations which are ostensibly negative in a positive way. You know, this is a, a form of developing oneself. And Nietzsche, again, write, writes about oneself as a work of art. You know, one should constantly uh, tuck away the negative aspects, enhance the positive, positives, uh, work on weaknesses you have, you know, try to overcome these anxieties, these melancholies, what one might have, yeah. And by doing that, of course, you know, that will in itself change your relation to other people as well. So, yeah, instead of trying to change the world, one should first try to change oneself. Quite right. Yeah, that's something that I like to harp on quite a lot, just because it's it's the only real prescription that I can make that I feel fits. Because uh, that's one thing, though, that I do have a history of and a problem with is being super prescriptive in general. And I, that's one of the things I appreciated most about your book, Peter, was that I was able to see how my own Christian upbringing was still completely impacting me and influencing the way I looked at things in a way that I wasn't realizing. And choosing to value something is a lot more powerful than feeling that you must value it, that there's no choice. Yeah. And also, I think another as means of, um, as it were, developing oneself is not to attack another view, but rather promote your own viewpoint. And I think that's the best way to instill, install or instill your own subjective values upon the world. You know, you sort of just talk about the, the, you know, whatever is good about the way you see the world and then others might connect to that rather than being negative and criticizing, criticizing a, a viewpoint you disagree with. That's what I, gen what I generally try. I generally try to do that, but of course, sometimes it's just too tempting, uh, you know, it's sometimes just too tempting to attack something, but I try to avoid it as much as possible. Yeah. It's better to promote the, potentials that you can build and create than to try to tear down other people's gigs in general. But uh, I also really like the Alistair Crowley notion that um, a true magician has to know the exact and perfect nullification of every ideal that they hold in order to actually be able to be a, to affect change in a sense. Mm, interesting. I, I've never heard that. I'm quite interested in Crowley, though. His son lived um, in, a, in a little uh, village very close to where I live now in Cornwall, a few miles away. So I was reading an article about it. And he, Alistair Crowley himself, he spent a lot of time here in Western Cornwall, in uh, Penzance and other places. A lot of legends about him around here.
And um, from what I've read, he's um, a yeah, very, very interesting character. But I, I, I can't say I've read any of his books in their entirety. Well, my thing is that I spent a lot of time being convinced by programming that I didn't realize I had about certain characters like Crowley or like Nietzsche that their philosophy wasn't worth looking into because of certain re- supposed resultant behaviors that their philosophies led to. Whether you're looking at Nazism being connected with German philosophy in general or with Crowley supposedly being a sorcerous black magician, having never actually looked into certain people's writings for myself, that how can I take other people's word for it? I actually finally checked out a book by Crowley that may be an odd one to be checking out for the first book, but it was his writing on Atlantis. And I think it's a very interesting topic to get into just because a lot of the what, what we get with the mainstream representation of any great thinker or philosopher is usually just a packaged thing that fits the, mod, the mainstream paradigm and leaves out anything else that might conflict. And then people don't even really have a lot of knowledge about those aspects of thought, whether it's Freud's work on ancient Egypt and the origins of Judaism or you talking about some of the more some of the more empowering and not quite so just destructively nihilistic parts of Nietzsche or the fact that Crowley in general when quoted in certain things like talking about sacrifice was usually just describing something not prescribing something all in all the ancient philosophers talked a lot about things like Atlantis and and these uh, the realm of essence that you know even though we're building a lot of our modern stuff off of Aristotle who was basing it off of ones that came before we're leaving out some of the other stuff that those same thinkers still did talk about yeah I mean one should always go to the source I've made the same errors myself for example I didn't read Schopenhauer for many years because Nietzsche always criticized him and uh, I thought oh, okay yeah, you must be right about him then Nietzsche <laughs> so I just left it out but of course Nietzsche was first of all got into philosophy through Schopenhauer because he was trained in philology of course but when I did decide to read Schopenhauer I just realized you know what a, what a, what a what a great writer what a what a thought thought inspiring genius he was so one should always go to the source you know no, never take an opponent's word for it obviously with regard to atlantis I think the first mention of it was in the ancients, yeah, in Plato, in the Timaeus, in a book called Timaeus, <laughs> which I read recently. I mean, I don't know if you've read that, but it's it's really, really strange. You know, it's, it's uh, he talks about it as if it's a real place, and he talks about the uh, the fact. That I think that the the kings, eight kings of Atlantis, something like this, something like eight kings of Atlantis, met every um, fifth and sixth year in order to respect both odd and even numbers. <laughs> and then they performed, uh, after their meeting, they sort of performed these bull hunting within the palace itself. And and then some very abstract mathematical uh, descriptions and, and whatnot. It's just, it's just a really, really odd book, you know. But if you haven't read it, I recommend it. Yeah, that's going to have to go on my list. Well, I look forward to talking in the future about other things that you end up writing and getting into because I, I definitely love to see where you take things from here. I super, super enjoyed the book. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah, I enjoyed this conversation. Thanks a lot, even though it's very late for me, but uh, it's, I've, I've enjoyed it a lot. So thanks. Well, that's great uh, to hear. I really appreciate you being able to stick around for the whole two hours, even though it's late. I think this is probably the most the most technical and and well referenced conversation on philosophy i've ever had in my life so (laughs) let alone on this podcast so thank you for bringing this depth to the show because i think this will give people a lot of resources to check into if they like any of the things we talked about from kant to schopenhauer to to nietzsche and and how to not necessarily take any one person's word for it but look at how their concepts apply in your own experience i guess yes always go to the primary source and apply it to your own life in your own way well all right that's it for us guys thank you peter for being on the show and we'll talk to you guys later well, guys, that's it for my chat with Peter Shurstead H. I really enjoyed talking to him. I think you could tell that it's really interesting to me to have these kind of very technical conversations about just what it is that we can know, how we can know that we know it, and figuring out the distinction between when 
it's something that we can actually prove empirically versus something that is coming from our culture that we might not even realize is coming from our culture. As somebody that's always talking about right and wrong and morality and natural, universal, philosophical law, this conversation being so oriented around nihilism might even seem like I've contradicted past viewpoints I might have held on the show or things I might have postulated. And the fact of the matter is, I'm like you guys. I make stuff up as I go. <laughs> I, I don't think that I do hold any one particular view or philosophical notion to be the ultimate underpinnings or the, the grounds by which everything else can be known for certain. In fact, it does make more sense to me that there aren't really any objective rules to morality and that we do kind of make it up as we go because doesn't that make it more powerful for us to be making the choice instead of being forced to conform to some sort of, I guess, ultimate daddy in the sky that people call God. I don't really need that. I think it's a lot more powerful if I'm choosing for myself to be compassionate when I can, kind when I can, and doing the best that I can for my fellow man, which is probably not true, but working to strive towards that. And, you know, none of us are perfect, but at the end of the day, it does come down to being a nice person or a not nice person that determines what your reality experience is going to be like. So whether or not you can point to some book of laws that came from a magical man in the sky or human laws that have been passed by the rich and greedy <laughs> to control us. At the end of the day, there's just you and your own conscience, your own personal feelings on what it is that you do and why that you do it. And getting to the root of why we have our own feelings and why we look at morality the way we do, it really helps us separate our true feelings from that which has been imposed on us. So of course, I'm still going to talk about natural law and I'm still going to talk about right and wrong going forward. But after this conversation, and especially after reading Peter's book, I do have a new look on what nothingness really means. And, you know, this is a notion that's come from Eastern mysticism very heavily. The inherent void or abyss, the, the non-physicality, the non-materiality. The illusory nature of what it is that we call life doesn't make it less valuable. It doesn't make it less important. I think it actually makes things better that everything's kind of nothing because that way what we build is our creation and not some alien Abrahamic father figure that we have to bow down to. Anyway, that's enough rambling about that. I hope I've justified my conversation with Peter here enough for you guys. I think the conversation justifies itself, though. Now, while I've got you here, let's talk about what you're missing out on the extended version of this episode that's available for Plus members. We talked a lot more. We Honestly, I think we put the cap on some of the things we were talking about in the Plus extension and... You're not, you're not really going to get the full extent of what it is that we're analyzing with the philosophy that we're talking about unless you check out the Plus extension. And that's available over on patreon.com forward slash interverse. You can find links to that on my website if you go to interverse.com, interversepodcast.com that is. And go up to the top. There's a link where it says Plus. That'll take you there. The reason you're going to want to do this is you get early access episodes. You get much longer content and you get a few other cool things that I don't need to go into here. But what I will go into is some of the things that we talked about in this plus extension. First of all, one of my favorite things we got into was the fact that the comic book writer, Warren Ellis, who very responsible for a lot of the modern Iron Man character, he recreated another character from Marvel called Karnak. And it was inspired by Peter's writing in his book, Pneumonautics. So we talked about that. He's a superhero that sees the flaw in all things, the crack in every wall, if you will. And it's interesting to me to look at comic book culture at large, which is something we did explore a bit, which was cool. We also analyzed 
warrior worship and how that relates to comic book culture and mythological pantheons. We talked about master morality versus slave morality and overcoming control dialectics with personal empowerment. We analyzed anarchy and the fact that your inner, nem- your inner nemesis is also your biggest ally in terms of strengthening you. We considered the consequences of order following and we talked about both David Hume and C.L. Stevenson, language and ethics, and sentiment-based judgments, and the mystery of suicide. That was a really interesting thing to talk about. Also, a more deep examination of morality and how it relates to our survival, redefining wisdom in terms of neo-nihilistic non-judgmentality. We talked about Peter meeting a couple of artists called the Frouds. They are the ones who created the creatures in films like Labyrinth and The Dark Crystal. So pretty psychedelic puppeteers, pretty interesting people to meet. We also talked a little bit about my own psychedelic phenomenological experiences and the reality of imagined things and the dangerously beautiful yin-yang of the infinite sublime. Oh Man, this was such a jam-packed plus extension. We also talked about Aleister Crowley, talked about Carl Jung, talked about the acquisition of mystical states as the next rung in the evolutionary ladder towards the Nietzschean overman, and of course more reasons why we should always go to the primary source and apply it to our life in our own way. So thank you again, Peter. This was really a just packed episode full of so much interesting and uh, well thought out philosophical reasoning. Very excited to be putting this out to you guys. I've also got a really good couple of episodes coming out in the coming weeks. So in general, it's a good time to be a listener to Interverse Podcast, and I thank you for doing so. If you're not inter- interested in signing up on Patreon and getting the plus content, you can always leave us a review on iTunes when you subscribe there through your podcast player app. That's a good way to help the show get found by new people. I'll even read new reviews if they come in on a future episode. Don't have any new ones to read right now, though. So thanks for listening. Once again, don't forget to look at the show notes for links to things like the music in this episode, like Tempe. That's the guy whose music I put in this show here. Really awesome Bay Area producer making that squishy, glitchy, (laughs) electronic-y, whatever it is. I love this kind of music. If you like Tipper, you like Tempe. Makes sense. Kind of a similar name. Anyway, really awesome. Find the links to him. Find the links to the things we talked about in the show notes. Interversepodcast.com. Patreon.com forward slash Interverse. There's links all over. Go get you something nice over at Patreon. Even if it's not from me. There's so many artists you could be supporting. And it is, it is pretty reasonable in my opinion to ask for a voluntary donation for extended episode content. I mean... You'd pay an artist for a print of something they painted, so why not feasibly pay me for something that I spent my time creating? Hey, it's fine. Do or do not. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Am I right? So, no big deal if you don't sign up to Plus. Pretty awesome if you do. I think you'll like what you get, especially if you like the podcast, because we do just expand and go deeper on everything that's happening in the weekly show. All right, that's it for me, guys. I'll be back next week. Love y'all.